serve an awesome and powerful God. He is the God of firm foundation. He is our own rock and only solid ground. Let's worship him today.
to the fatherless defender of the weak freedom for the prisoner we see this is God in his holy place this is God clothed in
Amen. Mighty and strong is our God, and that's why we are here to worship him. We welcome all of you. We're so glad you have a, a, a Sunday morning. You've decided to come and worship with us on a cold Sunday morning. I think we just kind of bypassed fall and went straight to winter. Is that what it feels like? We're glad that you here are, are here with us today. If you're a longtime member or a tender or a brand new uh, first-time visitor with us today, we encourage everybody to take out a, a connections card. This is at the bottom of your bulletin there. It looks like this on the wall. And if you would just take a few moments to fill that out as, uh, as we continue to worship together this morning, you'll find out more about what to do with that, the Connections card at the bottom of that card in just a few moments. Uh, yesterday in our country, as a nation, we celebrated, uh, uh, honored those who have served in our military and our armed forces. And I thought we should t- do that today as well and just take a moment. So we're going to bring up the house lights, and I'm going to ask anyone who has served as uh, part of our military, if you would stand and let us honor you today, would you stand? We certainly appreciate all you ladies and gentlemen who are veterans, and thank you for your service. We thank you for being uh, members of the armed forces, but as as, uh, well being members of God's kingdom and worshiping him this morning. We're glad you're here. This morning, let's just continue to give God our praise. He is a strong God. He is our mighty leader. And we sing this wonderful song that reminds me of a great uh, Celtic praise song. Elise is going to lead us. He's the king of my heart. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. You're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, and let the king of my heart be the
I invite you to stand up with us. Let's stand and sing. If I were to tell you my story, it would be a story of love and grace and forgiveness from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If I told you my story, you would hear hope that wouldn't let go. And if I told you my story, you would hear love and never gave up. And if I told you my story, you would hear life, but it wasn't mine. If I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sin, of when justice was served. And draw
praising God all day. That's our story. Thank you. Be seated, please. Yesterday, we had a wonderful Saturday as many of our families came with their newly uh, born children and some older children and dedicated them uh, to, the God, to God's service. So let's share and watch some of these beautiful faces together. several parents and kids come out to the child dedication brunch yesterday morning and it was a really great way for the parents to say we want to seek God's guidance and will in raising our children to love and respect God and we want to surround our kids with a Christian community that will help us do that. As a church family, we want to celebrate this commitment these families made and be able to say, hey, we want to come alongside you and help you and support you as you raise your kids and help them to grow and follow Jesus. So let's do that together now with the words on the screen. We recognize the need to support these families as they grow in their walk with Christ. We recognize the awesome and joyous responsibility we have to represent God's family to your children. And so we state our willingness to partner with you now. Congregation, please promise with me. We promise to fulfill our responsibility to you and your children in teaching, serving, loving them so they may see the face of Jesus mirrored in us. We'd like to now say a special blessing over these families and over all of us. So if you're a parent or are help raising a kid, of these kids or of any kids, please stand now where you are. And if you're close by them and would lay a hand on their arm or shoulder and just do this as a way to affirm your blessing to them through God, please stand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please bless these beautiful children and their parents. Thank you so much for the gift of children and for the gift of life. Thank you for these that are standing in our midst and help us as your church to love and support them as they love and support their kids. And may all of this honor you, mighty God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And now we're going to have the opportunity to give our offerings as part of our worship this morning in just a minute. And as you prepare for that, I encourage you to pull out the connection card that Mike mentioned earlier and go ahead and fill that out, and you can just place it in the offering plate as it comes by. If you're a first-time guest with us, though, just hold on to that card, and after the service, you can go down the front steps there and into the atrium to the connections kiosk and just hand it to the person there, and we would love to give you a wonderful gift to tell you thank you so much for joining us today. Now, as we come into this time of offering, it's important to remember that if you are a guest today, please don't feel any pressure to give. You can participate if you'd like, but really, this is an opportunity for those of us who call First Christian Home to give as an act of worship and thanksgiving. Join me in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your abundant blessings. As we worship you now with our tithes and offering, we ask that you will bless it, multiply it, and use it to spread the gospel around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey everyone, I'm Leanne Fama. I'm going to tell you a few things happening in the next couple months that you won't want to miss. You can find out more about these announcements and other events in your bulletin or online at fcc-jc.org. This week is our annual Thanksgiving feast on Wednesday, November 15th here at FCC. This year we are welcoming Greater Love International Church to join us for the meal. So come on out, enjoy some fellowship, and a turkey dinner from Shirley's Restaurant. You can RSVP for this meal on your Connections card or online. Speaking of the holidays, Christmas is just around the corner, and we want to make this place as warm and inviting as possible. FCC is looking for people to help decorate and build sets in time for December. We also need decoration donations, items like red ribbons and mesh, white Christmas lights and spray paint, battery-operated candles and glitter. If you are feeling the Christmas spirit and want to help out, contact Jan Spencer. Also coming up in December is the Salvation Army bell ringing at the mall at Johnson City. Proceeds from this event goes towards helping the underprivileged of Johnson City. We need bell ringers to serve in pairs for two-hour shifts. Time slots are available from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. You can sign up for this event at the outreach kiosk in the atrium. Over the last few weeks, you have heard about our SEND campaign. Here at FCC, we want to actively and intentionally raise up future leaders of God's church. To create awareness for this initiative, senior pastor Ethan Magnus is hosting SEND dessert meetings. Everyone is welcome to attend one of these informational sessions to hear more about FCC's vision and ask any questions you might have. The next meetings are on November 13th and 16th. We'll meet here at the FCC Library at 7 p.m. And finally, if you're 55 or older, you don't want to miss the birthday bash happening today, November 12th at 5 p.m. in the CLC. We are celebrating October, November, and December birthdays with a catered meal and entertainment. If you haven't RSVP'd, there's still time. Make your way down to the welcome kiosk in the atrium during services this morning. Those are all your announcements for this week, but be sure to check out the Vision News and our Facebook and Twitter to keep up with everything that's going on here at FCC. Have a great week. We approach this table, the Lord's table, and I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Christ. And I wonder how could he love someone like me, a sinner condemned unclean. Sing these words with us. How marvelous, how babies right <laughs> you have to smile when you look at them and they bring us so much joy and are such blessings to our lives but I'm sure if you ask their parents and all parents babies are a lot of work <laughs> kids are pretty helpless and pretty dependent upon their parents and caretakers just for everyday needs and even just to make it to survival this kind of reminds me of our relationship with Christ we're helpless and caught in sin and broken lives, yet because Jesus' death on the cross forgave us for our sins, we are cleansed and saved. He is the one we fully rely on for our eternal life and through his death and resurrection. We were helpless, dead in sin, and he gives us hope and life through him. 
And on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Today, as we approach the table, let's reflect on the great sacrifice that was made for us on the cross. Pray with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross and for the hope of eternity with you and for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask that we would seek you above all and that we would love you and love others well. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. quantitative, measurable data. So do we actually have, so vision metrics isn't um, what you actually want to do, but rather how do we get there? So again, we want X amount of leaders training X amount of people. The next thing we want is we want strategies. So our vision metrics is all about how we get there or we wanna raise up new leaders. So a good strategic metric would say, what are the number of, how many people did we talk to this week about actually leading? And so a very good way to do that um, would be to like train an inspection team. You could train a, um, maybe a maintenance team, maybe that if, if a car does break down in the middle of the parking lot, you, you, that team could come and help and assess the situation. It's everything that you wanna do tangibly to accomplish your goal. So if you wanna raise up, like I said earlier, 50 new leaders, in the span of a year. And if you do that, if you look at your strategies and say, okay, how can we do that? Well, a good strategy may be um, is that you want to um, have 40 motivated servants and four teams led by discipling and reproducing leaders who oversee a safe and highly welcoming parking experience. And that would be a perfect time to better get with our leaders. 
And so if we do that, I think that um, our, our leaders that we raise up will be a lot better. So the best thing I ever said about strategies was mediocre strategies that are well executed beat perfect strategies poorly executed. Then we want to come up with strategies to get there. So if we only check on the vision metrics, we will not make prog uh, progress. So for example, if we're always looking at the number of volunteers that we have, then we'll never progress because we're always focused on numbers. We're not focused on training those leaders to get up to a certain point. So that concludes our meeting today. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything that you just anything that would ever cross your mind during this meeting today? Yes? I mean, are, are we going to talk about this or? Uh, talk, talk about what? Hey friends, good to be with you. Are we going to talk about this? That's what the elephant is all about. My name is Ethan Magnus. If you're a guest with us today, we are so glad that you're here. Welcome, and you're in the right place. We're talking about the elephant in the room, uh, the things that affect and impact our lives, but yet somehow we never end up talking about. This, this series has been interesting. It had a lot of resonance with people. I've had several people email in to say, are we going to talk about this? And it's interesting, everything they've emailed in, I've been like, oh, wow, that's a great topic. No, we're not going to talk about it, but we will the next time. I feel like we should immediately do another one of these series. People, I, I think a lot of us have this sense that there are some things that we need to talk about in the church, but we don't talk about enough. And, and we, the, the silence kind of wears at us. So I'm, I may not get to the thing you wish we talked about, but maybe we'll get to it in the future. Clearly, there's a lot of energy around this. Before actually we get to today's elephant, I do want to just do a little bit of recap. Two weeks ago, we rolled out the Send campaign. Uh, so if you were here, you heard about that. Maybe you got one of these flyers. If you weren't here, though, I want you to know about this. This is our end of year offering this year. Our goal is to make a major investment to make a permanent difference in the sending capacity of this church and our region. Uh, we think that the, the, the future of the church lies in, in the balance and how we respond to this moment. And so we want to raise up leaders and send them out. If you've got questions about it, please pick up one of these flyers so you can know what the end of the year offering is going toward. Uh, we've got some desserts coming up. Show up for one of those. I'd be happy to answer your questions and talk to you about it uh, then. It's been fun to watch people catch the vision and get excited about it. And, and many people have started to give, some very, very generously. In fact, one of our major generous givers, I want to tell his story. We, don't, we won't tell the story of every giver, but I want you to know this guy's story. He has given so generously. His name is Eli Long. He's one of our students, and he recently got some gifts for his birthday, and he knew exactly what he was going to do with them. I want you to watch this little video he sent to somebody who had given him a gift. Thank you, Nancy, for the card and the money. Tell and you. I'm going to do with that, all of that money. I'm going to make it, I'm, um, I'm going to give it to my church, and then, um, People who don't have churches, um, I'm gonna, um, the church is gonna, our church is gonna put that for them. That's nice. Okay, blow her a kiss. Say thank you. Mm, thank you. <laughs> All right, that's the cutest thing you ever saw. Isn't that amazing? But see, that kid gets it. He gets, he, I mean, I love how he described the sin campaign. He's gonna give this money to our church for the people who don't have churches. Because our church is going to use this money to start churches for the people who don't have churches. And that's exactly what the Sin Campaign is about. And he did it, just you know. Uh, this last week, he brought in his bucket of money, not just his birthday money, but also all the money he'd been saving for a long time. It's got a big E on it right there for Eli. And he brought it in, he gave it to the church, and we're going to do just what he wants us to do with it, which is use it to start churches for people who don't have churches. Because Eli gets how important it is that we sin. So I just want, if Eli's generosity might inspire you, I know it's inspired Betsy and I, and it's made us think about just how generous we can be in this moment. Let's get talking, though, about the elephant. This week's elephant is a sociological phenomenon. I know some of you just fell asleep. Wake back up. It's an interesting sociological phenomenon. This week's elephant is a sociological phenomenon that has never happened before in the history of the world. 
The sociological phenomenon that is our elephant today is this. For the first time ever, we have five generations of human beings alive and active all at the same time. This hasn't happened before. Five generations of people with their different backgrounds and different expectations in your families, in your businesses, in your cultural institutions, and in your church, all trying to work together, live together, and worship together all at the same time. In fact, one of the reasons this elephant is so hard for us to talk about is because it's such a totally new elephant. This elephant has never come around before, so we're not always sure exactly what to say about it. The old elephant that we used to talk about was three generations. When I first entered ministry in the uh, mid-90s, my grandfather, Calvin Phillips, got me a book. He was a minister too. He got me this book. It's entitled Three Generations. It was published in 1995. Riding the waves of change in your church. You remember in the 90s, we t- the way we talked about this generational clash, we had this slang, we called it the worship wars, which sounds, sounds kind of spooky, and this is a spooky book. Listen to the back cover. Today, local churches are faced with the enormous challenge of integrating three vastly different demographic groups, the builders, the boomers, and the busters. This is before we got old enough, and we call ourselves Generation X, not the busters. Thank you very much. But anyways, this church shows church leaders how to ride the wave of the future and survive the riptides of change. And the whole book reads with that same kind of horror movie narrator voice. Like, what are we going to do? How are we possibly going to navigate these three generations that are clashing over leadership in the church? And this book observes what basically every cultural observer has, that when we talk about generations, we aren't talking about age difference as much as we're talking about culture difference. In fact, most people who study this estimate that between the generations, there's roughly an 80% cultural overlap. So between the builders and the boomers, there's about 80% of their cultural memory, the music they like, the movies they watch, the historical events that were important to them, 80% of it they share in common, and 20% of it's different. But between the builders and Generation X, they only share 60% of their cultural values and habits and practices and memories. And 40% is different. And, And books like this were written to talk about how hard it was to be in the church when you disagreed on 40% of your music selections and your movie selections and your dress selections. How hard that 40% made it. Well, listen, if three generations was an elephant in the room of the church in 1995, it was a baby elephant compared to what we face today, which is five generations in the church. Part of the reason we have more generations in the church today is, thank God, people are living longer, healthier, more active lives. The other reason is cultural change is happening more quickly, and so generational groupings are becoming more narrow, where we used to talk about generational groupings of like 25 years, now we're down to 20 and even 15 years for some of the rising generational groupings. Yet this thing about 20% cultural difference has remained. And so the reality we have today is very different than the reality we had in 1995. The reality of cultural difference today looks like this. Between the top generation, what we'll call the builders and the boomers, they share about 80% cultural values and expectations. Between the top generation and Gen X, that's me, they share about 60%. They share 60% cultural values and expectations. Between the top generation, the builders, and the millennial generation, that's people in their uh, 30s and 20s, they share 40% of cultural expectations and values. Between the top generation and the coming generation, the next generation, kind of 18 and below, they share 20% cultural values and expectations. So if you're a grandparent or a great uncle or great aunt hanging out with some young person and you think to yourself, what world did they come from? I feel like we have nothing in common. 
you're basically exactly right. You have almost nothing in common. You share 20%. And likewise, if you're a young person, and you figure, I, 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 my grandparents don't make sense to me at all. I feel like they totally don't get me. You're exactly right. They totally don't get you. Cultural researchers today say that a 20-year-old in Johnson City has more in common culturally with a 20-year-old in Paris than with an 80-year-old in Johnson City. That the five-generation cultural gap is actually bigger than the cultural gap between continents. This is the reality in which we live. And, and this affects everything, right? It affects our workplaces. It affects our families. It affects our churches. One of the reasons it affects so much, when we talk about this cultural distance and cultural overlap, it is culture that gives meaning to the symbols of our life. Culture is what tells us what symbols mean. Uh, think about dress for a second. It, it, it's the culture you have absorbed that tells you what it means to be dressed up or to not be dressed up. That's not an absolute rule. You learned that culturally. I, I spoke recently at a gathering of local churches, and I spoke about Surprise the World. And since we made t-shirts for Surprise the World, I wore a t-shirt with a jacket over it to preach. I was not at all surprised that after I preached, among the many comments I got, the most common topic of conversation was my t-shirt. And everybody who mentioned it, 55 or an older, said something like this. Well, I didn't know what to expect when you came out in that t-shirt, but you actually ended up doing okay. You were pretty good for a guy in a t-shirt or something like that. Every person 35 or younger said something like this. Oh, it was so nice to see somebody in a t-shirt. I could tell you really cared about us and wanted us to listen to you. Isn't that funny? Just to be clear, I only wore one t-shirt, right? They're talking about the same t-shirt, yet it meant opposite things to them. Why would that be? Well, it's because of this. The top two generations in our country interpret being dressed up as a symbol that means you care about what you're doing, you are a professional, and you're trying hard to do a good job. It's a symbol that means professionalism and excellence and that you care. Our bottom two generations also interpret being dressed up as a symbol. It's a symbol that means you're arrogant and think you're better than other people, and you don't care about the people you're doing it with. Because if you cared about them, you would have dressed more casually so you could build a stronger relationship with them. It's the same suit. It's the same tie, and yet these two generations at opposite ends of the spectrum of the five generations that we have living and sharing the church together interpret it to mean almost the exact opposite thing. It, it isn't just about suits. We do this with so many of the symbols in our world are read differently and interpreted differently by different generations. Think about the telephone. This is such a perfect example of how people use the telephone. For some of you, I'm going to explain your grandparents, your grandkids to you in just a second. For some of you, I'm going to explain your grandparents to you, okay? Builders use the telephone like this. When the phone rings, you answer it. And you answer it as quickly as possible because they remember the days when the phone would ring on the other side of the house and you would run across the house to pick it up fast enough. When the phone rings, you answer it. On the other hand, if, if you don't reach somebody, you aren't upset by that because they also remember the days when you often called and no one answered and you would just call back later. And so builders kind of live in that world. Boomers, they also, like their builder parents, they, when the phone rings, you answer it because they also remember those pre-cell phone days. But the boomers have had a cell phone long enough now that they know that when you don't answer it, you have no excuse because that phone was in your back pocket. And so if a boomer calls you and you don't answer, they know it's because you're ignoring them on purpose. And at the very least, you better call back fast or text to explain that you're on the other line if a boomer gives you a phone call. But if you call a boomer on the phone, man, they will answer that phone. My parents, bless their hearts, they will answer the phone whenever it rings, for whatever reason, whoever it is. If the phone rings, you answer it. 
That's what they do. Now, we Gen Xers, we invented this thing called call screening. Because, see, our entire professional lives, we've had cell phones. Since the very first job we got, we've had cell phones. And what we discovered is this. If you answer the phone every time it rings, you will never get anything done. And because your phone is with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you have to at some times just not answer it. So we've gotten really good at that. Every time the phone rings, we look first before we answer it, see who it is, make a decision. We sometimes answer, we sometimes don't. Remember, here's my hint to you. If it's a boomer who's calling you, they expect you to answer it. If it's a builder, you can ignore it and call them back the next day. They'll, they won't think twice about it because they'll assume it, you, you, they'll think it was a landline. Okay, they'll forget it. it was just, okay, so, but now here's the thing. It, it, already, we're three generations and we use phones that differently. Let me tell you about millennials. Millennials, when you call a millennial, they know what it is. They know how phones work. They're familiar with the principle, but they take it as a personal affront that you would interrupt their day with a phone call. Think of all the other options. You could have texted them or emailed them or Facebook messaged them or private messaged on Instagram or Snapchatted them. Why would you do the one method of communication that's intrusive and interrupts whatever they do that doesn't work on their timetable or allow them to work you into their schedule? What's your problem? Why would you even think to call them? That's how millennials treat the phone. Younger than that, kids under 20, they don't even, they're not even sure what that noise is. You know, my kids come to me, Dad, my phone just keeps vibrating and making noise over and over, and I think it's broken. No, you're getting a phone call from your grandmother, and she expects you to answer it because she's a boomer. So answer the phone, right? Okay? So this, and, and I tell my kids, they're, they're trying to work things out, like for a sleepover or whatever, like, have you gotten a hold of them yet? Like, I don't know. I sent them four texts. I'm like, did you call them? They look at me like I have four heads. Did I call them? No, I didn't call them. Okay, listen. This is just the telephone. And we're that different. We can't even agree how to use the telephone. And you all see this in your own families, right? You're trying to communicate where you're, what you're going to do for Thanksgiving or what you're going to do, for, what restaurant you're going to go out and eat, right? You've got to write a letter to one generation, or send a phone call to another generation, shoot an email to the next generation, a text message to the third generation, and nobody knows how to communicate with the next generation, okay? You know what I'm saying? Right, this is it, right? Just to plan where we're going to go to dinner this afternoon. We've had to use three different types of communication. And then you come to the church. I love that I've been at this church not very long when uh, I was in that mode where people were giving me advice and most of it was great advice and I need lots of advice so don't stop I need your advice but every once in a while we had these funny moments where I would get the opposite advice like in a very short period of time you know how that is so in the very same week I got this advice somebody came up to me and said Ethan you know we could save a lot of hassle if we just did completely away with printing the announcements nobody ever uses printed announcements ever the very same week, somebody else said to me, you know, Ethan, we could save a lot of hassle if we stopped pointing people to the website to get information about events. Nobody ever goes to a website to look for information about a church, ever. Would you be surprised to know the person who gave me the first advice was in their 20s and the person who gave me the second advice was in their 70s? No, you wouldn't be surprised at all. And here's the thing, they were both right because they were talking about different cultures. One was talking about a millennial culture and one was talking about a builder culture. And by and large, most of our builders don't think, I wonder what's going on at church, I should check the website. And by and large, most of our millennials never think, I wonder what's going on at church, I should check the flyer. Isn't that fascinating? And yet, here's the thing, God is not surprised by this. And God calls us to be a multi-generational church. Psalm 78. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. 
We will not hide them from, the next, from their descendants. We will tell them to the next generation. His praiseworthy deeds, the Lord, his powers and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob. He established the law in Israel when he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet unborn, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his disease, deeds, but keep his commands. Did you notice there in verse 5 and 6, we had five generations. He commanded the ancestors who taught their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in ten would tell their children. God anticipated the five-generational church. He is not caught off guard, and God says that we are up to the challenge. We will not minimize the challenge of being a five-generational church, but we will also not shrink back from God's clear instruction that each generation be in ministry and connection with the next, passing on what God has taught us. In fact, God goes further. God actually tells us uh, to be especially careful with two generations. Did you know that? God's Word has two favorite generations. You're worried for a second. You're wondering if you're in it, right? Okay? Okay, I'll I'll warn you in advance. If you're my age, you are not in one of God's favorite two generations. So I'm sorry. i just break your heart there, right there. But if you're not in my age, you might be, because here's what God's Word says. God's Word especially calls us to care for the top generation. And God's Word especially calls us to care for the next generation. James 1.27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Do you hear that special care for the top generation and for the next generation? Leviticus 19.32, stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. Honor and care for the top generation is the universal expectation of God's word. Old Testament and new, we're reminded that God's people are a multi-generational people who are called to honor and care for the top generation. But even more frequently than that, we're reminded that God's people are a multi-generational people who are called to teach and welcome the coming generation. We saw this in Psalm 78, generation after generation after generation teaching. Deuteronomy 11, though, is the same principle. Deuteronomy 11, the first 18 verses, recount the great work that God has done among us. And then after this remembering of God having saved God's people, then we have this instruction. Teach this to your children. Talk about it when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write it on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. This obligation to teach the next generation is all throughout God's word. I was ready for that. I kind of was expecting that. You're probably not too surprised by that too. There are lots and lots of verses about teaching generations. I was caught off guard, though, by the emphasis on welcoming the next generation. It wasn't until I actually was prepping for this sermon I noticed that's actually Jesus' emphasis. What he adds to the already emphasis of teaching the next generation is this emphasis on welcoming the next generation. Look at Matthew 19. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such of these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Mark 9 records a different encounter that's even clearer. Uh, Jesus takes a little child and places him in the middle of his disciples. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. This principle 
that we must, as a church, intentionally welcome the next generation is so powerful. Because see, to welcome the next generation moves beyond just teaching them. We can teach them while we teach them to act like us. To welcome them, we must welcome who they are and learn what they value. I mean, you all know how to do this, right? When you have a big dinner party for your multi-generational families, right? After you cook all the fancy food that all the adults love, have you ever done that thing where at the last minute you make a couple peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or you throw some tater tots and chicken nuggets into the oven just to make sure there'll be some food that everybody likes? Anybody here done that? Come on, anybody here? Last minute throwing together some... Go on, go a few of you have, okay? Somebody over there is like, I ate the tater tots. No, that's what, yeah, there he is. Okay, he's with me over there. Yeah, okay. Right, okay. We do this. We, we do this because we recognize that collard greens and soup beans are an acquired taste, and we don't want our children to go hungry just because they can't eat collard greens yet. Okay, we get this, yeah. Or maybe because we don't want to fight about collard greens in the middle of Thanksgiving. I get that too, right? This is what we do to make the next generation feel welcome. We find what they value and include it in our gatherings. We find what they are passionate about, and we get passionate about it too. Jesus is saying, whoever welcomes the next generation welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Here at First Christian Church, we're trying to get strategic about this. We believe that we are still, as God's people always have been, called to be a multi-generational church. So this means, number one, we've got to care especially for the top generation. We're trying to be strategic about that. We got Phil Torbett transitioning into a senior adults pastoral role. We got new programming coming for our top generation. Hope you heard birthday bashes today. Not too late to sign up. Come enjoy the festivities there. Single seniors event on the 16th. We've got a widows ministry is caring for widows. Our, our high school and college ministries just launched this spontaneously because they know the word of God says they got to care for the top generation. We got this handyman ministry busting at the seams ready to care for people in that top generation. We're not going to shrink in our responsibility to care for the top generation and to honor them and to make sure that our five-generational church includes our top generation. But likewise, we're investing like crazy in the next generation. We've got this amazing children's ministry and youth ministry, and we're doing some more staffing there to try and strengthen their post programs right now. We've got new programs launching. And I'll just say, remember we just made that, the kids, did you notice the promise you had to make during that uh, children's thing we did a little while ago, right? We promised as a church to, to serve those families and to help them teach and educate their kids and to welcome their kids into our midst. So we need a lot more people to volunteer for those ministries so we can make good on those promises. And this place, this, I'll just be specific about this room. We want this room to be a room of welcome to the next generation. Families, you just want to know if you're out there, you're sixth graders, I mean, you're, you're a middle school and high school students, we think this service and all our services are for them. Please bring them, also send them to Sunday school, but we want them in here. We want this to be a place of welcome for them. We're strategic about that. We want to be a five-generational church with a five-generational worship service. I want to say a little bit about worship services for a second, because that is where it is the hardest, isn't it, is in the worship service. You can be, have, to have a five-generational Sunday school program is easy. It's got a Sunday school class for every generation. They never have to talk to each other. We're all fine. But the worship service is where it's hard. This thing about welcome, Jesus was on to something. He usually is. There's all this research that's been shown. The single biggest predictor of whether a 30-year-old feels welcome in the church is whether they felt welcome in the church when they were 15. That's it. The biggest way to predict whether someone will stay active in the life of the church is whether they are in the main worship service when they're a teenager. Not whether they're in youth group. That's important. That makes a difference. But this is what makes the most difference. And the thing that determines whether they'll be here is whether all the other generations do what we need to do to make the youngest generation feel welcome in this place. But remember that thing we said about how the generation teaches us what our symbols mean? that nowhere is that more difficult than in worship, right? Because worship is all about symbols and what they mean. I was in a planning meeting. It had been six, seven months ago now, but it was mostly it was me and a bunch of 20-year-olds in the room. We were planning a worship service, 
And in the course of just talking about things, one of the people mentioned that the Hayes machine, that's the fog machine that you know you see used in some worship services, the Hayes machine was not going to be usable for this worship service. I, of course, didn't think two beats about this, didn't care a bit, so I just kept planning our way. But I could tell that everybody else in the room was kind of thrown off by this. And somebody else said, well, are you sure we can't use it? And somebody else said, well, maybe we could get it fixed. And somebody said, well, could we rent one or borrow one from some other church? And I, I finally said, wait a second, we've got a worship service. Why do we care if the haze machine is broken? Who cares about a haze machine? Now, listen, I'd met people who cared about a haze machine, but the only people I knew who cared about a haze machine in worship were the people who cared to make sure there would never be a haze machine in worship, right? Can I get an amen? Some of them are, some of them are y'all, right? You're, you're a little worried right now. You're a little scared, okay? So I said, how, why would you care if there's a haze machine in worship? Well, one of them just gave me the clearest answer. I said, well, you know how it is. When you walk in and the lights are right and the haze in the room is just right, you just feel called into worship. And I thought to myself, no. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I got nothing. I got nothing. I got nothing. But then as I thought more, I thought that's not true. I actually know exactly what they're talking about because I grew up in a little country church that had stained glass windows. And we were down in a pretty narrow valley, which means the sun, even after it rose, didn't hit the bottom of the valley. You know what I'm talking about, right? And it wasn't until about 10 in the morning that the sun would make it up over the edge of the mountains. And when the sun did make it up over the edge of the mountains, it was like somebody flipped on the lights and the beams of sun would shine in through the stained glass window that sat right in front of me in the pew. And I would watch the purple and yellows and blues and reds stream across me as the dust from the cushions on the pews kind of floated in the air. And it's funny, I, I know it's funny now to say it, but I I'm telling you, that light and that dust and those windows called me to worship. I was back in that room maybe a year ago. It was the middle of a Tuesday afternoon. I walked in and the lights were just like I remembered them. And I had no choice but to stop and sit and pray. So yes, I actually know exactly what they mean the little bit of light and some colored glass and some dust in the air might call a person to worship. It's just that my symbols aren't the same as their symbols. And if we're going to be a five-generation church, which is what the text calls us to, and have five-generation worship services, we're going to have to learn to love each other's symbols. Listen, I, and I don't, even know, I don't even have this all figured out. I'm not even sure that I'm doing it right. Listen, sometimes people ask me why I wear what I wear when I preach. Listen, believe me, I don't like having to think about what I wear, okay? For almost all of my life, I made all of my dress decisions the same way. I opened the drawer of shirts, took out the top shirt. I opened the drawer of pants, took out the top pair of pants. Whatever they were, I put them on and walked out the door and never thought about my clothes. I would love to go back. Let me tell you how I get dressed today. You ready? This is how I get dressed. I wear a jacket for the builders because they like jackets. I wear dress shoes, sometimes black, sometimes shiny brown, for the boomers because they're these you know, business people, working types. They like real shoes, you know. I wear a shirt, collar, but no tie for Gen Xers because we Gen Xers have made one significant contribution to society. When we all became adults, we all banded together to not wear ties. The rest of you all can thank the Gen Xers for that. We did that. That's why I wear a dress shirt, no tie. And I wear jeans for the millennials and the generation that's coming so that they'll know I care. Is it going to work? I have no idea. <laughs> but I'm committed to be a pastor to five generations. We're going to be a five-generational church, and we're going to have a five-generational worship service, which means we are going to love each other, and we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to learn, and we're going to listen, and we're going to pray, and we're going to hope, and we're going to trust because we know our God is a multi-generational God. Our God is not the God of the builders or the boomers or the Gen Xers or the millennials or the whatever's coming next or whatever's coming to that. He's the God of all of us and he's calling us to be a multi-generational church. It will not be easy and it will be the hardest in this room. Our cultural overlap is so narrow. We like different music. 
And we do a lot of singing in this room, don't we? We like different clothes. And some people care a lot about the clothes in this room. We like different environments, and yet here we try to come into one environment and worship. We like different kinds of art, yet, yet here we must share in the same artistic expression. And all of these things are super important, and the culture that taught us to love them is a good part of us. The good news is, there is a solution to how to pull off a five-generational church and a five-generational worship service. And the Apostle Paul wrote about it in his letter to the Philippians. Here's how you do it. Philippians chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from the fact that our unity is in Christ, not in culture, if you have been comforted by Christ's love more than you were comforted by whatever you prefer generationally, if you share in Christ's spirit, in God's spirit, more than you share in your generational identity, if you've received any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, Value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I know it's a bit cliche, but I'm convinced that like most problems the church faces, the solution to being a five-generational church is for us to be more like Jesus. The flat truth of the matter is that some of the symbols that I love and that help me worship, somebody from a different generation hates and they hurt their worship. And some of the symbols you love and that help you worship, some of the songs, some of the visuals, some of the whatever it is that, that you love and help you worship, they make it hard for some other generation to worship. And so Paul says this. He says, first, let's get humble about our own cultural values and make a distinction between what's cultural and what's biblical and be humble about what's cultural. Second thing he says is to don't look to your own interests but look to other people's interests which means we're going to have to seek to understand. I learned so much from that little funny conversation we had about that fog machine. Until that moment, it had never occurred to me that anybody's worship was helped by a fog machine. And then here I met these people who love Jesus so much, they give their lives for him. And they're telling me a fog machine helps them worship. I had to rethink fog machines after that conversation. Maybe you're a person who needs to talk to somebody who feels that way about the organ. And you'll rethink the organ or feels that way about choirs or feels that way about suits or feels that way about jeans or whatever it is. But it's seek to understand each other. And then once we understand each other, we become the advocate for the other person, not the advocate for ourselves. And over all this, we put on the mind of Christ, which always sought first the good of the other. And when we do this, because church, I want you to know, I think we can do this. This is not beyond us. I know it's not beyond us because it's what the Spirit of God wants for us. And when we do this, when we are a five-generational church, when we have five-generational worship services, when we have seen a unity in Christ that transcends the divisions of our culture, when we do this, the world will come knocking. And they'll ask us, how did you pull that off? How did you teach people to love each other who had 20% cultural overlap, had basically nothing in common except Jesus? How could you teach them to love each other? And we'll tell them, well, we loved Jesus more than we loved ourselves. And so we could love each other. Let's pray. Gracious God, we believe that our unity as God's children is more true about us than our division by generation. 
We believe that you, Jesus Christ, love us and are calling us to love one another. And we claim it as what you want for us and what we want for ourselves, that we would love one another. In the name of Jesus Christ, more than we love our own culture and our own preferences, and that we might be the five-generational church you are calling us to be. In the name of Jesus, who loves all people of every age and redeems them as children of the Father, we pray. Amen. Church of all ages, I invite you to stand as we sing together our celebration of God's grace. If you need a church home, I invite you to come and join us here. If you need to give your life to Christ, you'd be invited to do that as we sing. Let's sing together. If I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sin. I will Just for one second, I've got some people to introduce you to. Jody, are you coming down here? Yes, All right, awesome. This is Jody and Mary Smith, and I don't know your names. What's your name, bud? My name is DJ. DJ? Mm-hmm. Awesome. DJ, nice to meet you. Your name? Olivia. Olivia, fantastic. Jody, Mary, Olivia, and DJ. And uh, Jody and Olivia are coming here to join the church as members. And that's Will Blackmar, who's also here today to join the church. He was the brave one who admitted that he's still doing the uh, chicken nuggets, not the collard greens, right? Is that right? He did wear the tie, too. He did wear the tie. Look at that. That's multi generational right there. Like that. You see that? Like you see that? Wow. Man. Yeah, he's got, he's really, that, that, that's a guy. That's a guy. He's my poster child for this. All right. Well, awesome. Okay, so friends. You just heard me talk about that our unity is not found in what generation we're in or what kind of music we like or anything like that or how we dress, whether we wear ties or not, like me, uh, but in Jesus Christ. And so as you become membered into this fellowship, we are also membered with you, and I would invite you to repeat this confession after me. And let's all repeat with them along as with members together. I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. And He's my Lord. And He is my Savior. Amen. Welcome you all to membership here. We're so glad. All right, if you all can have a seat right there, and you all can have a seat, because we also have a baptism today right there. Awesome. Take it away, Krista. Good morning. This is Hunter Matney, and his parents are Greg and Amy Matney. And Hunter is in our preschool ministry, and he is just the most loving and caring kid. And he loves all the people around him and loves Jesus even more. So today, I'm going to baptize him, and he's going to commit his life to Jesus. Okay, Hunter, are you ready to repeat after me? Okay, I believe believe that Jesus is the Christ Christ. and my personal Savior. And I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a fantastic way to end our worship together. Please stand if you would. I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing on us and dismiss us. Oh, gracious God, send us out as one people. 
Let not the world divide us by age or any other means, but let us be united by Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Church, have a great week. Love somebody this week.